All right, wow, we have a hundred people here already. That's pretty awesome. And I think we'll just wait another minute and Hazel will kick us off. All right, seeing lots of familiar faces. Good to see you all. Yeah, and if you are not presenting today, if you would um, mute yourself, that would be appreciated. Yes, I'm seeing a question recording of this presentation. We will be sharing the recording of the presentation um, probably next week sometime. So yes, we'll be happy to share that. That'll be up on the BTLT website, up with Curtis Memorial Library. There'll be a bunch of ways to find it and we'll make sure it gets to you. All right, it looks like the entries are starting to slow down. Uh, we we let you in right at three o'clock this time, folks. I know, I know you're all getting nervous because normally we do a little before, but we are making this extra special. So hopefully that's why you had to wait that extra little bit of time. Um, I'm going to keep this short because I know I'm not the one you want to hear from and I'm right with you. But you, I am the one you want to talk to. My name is Hazel. I am a librarian at Curtis Memorial Library. But right now... Um, uh, I am also known as Tech Help. So if I've muted you by accident and you weren't supposed to be muted because you're speaking, or if you're just having troubles, I want you to message me. You can message me directly. Again, that's Tech Help. Just as a reminder, we are recording this. It might go viral, one never knows. So just make sure that if you're on camera or if you ask a question that you want to be seen and heard. We want to see and hear you. Uh, with that, I'm just so thankful for everyone coming here, for your interest in this topic, for our presenters and my co-conspirators who are just fabulous. Uh, with that, I'm going to send it off to Carrie. Thank you so much for working with your local library. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for being here. Um, just want to introduce Growing to Give for folks who aren't aware of our work. Um, we're a nonprofit farm located in Brunswick. We are what you would consider a grow for donation farm. So the produce that is grown is specifically um, to be sent into the community for people who are experiencing food. Uh, and we work uh, with volunteers to grow all this food. So if you are interested in coming to hang out in a beautiful farm space and work with other interesting uh, folks, your neighbors, other community members to, to get your hands dirty and, and pick up um, a gardening tip or two. You can come on to Growing to Give uh, this spring. We'll be kicking things off typically mid-March, um, but we've been doing a lot of educational work around regenerative farming. That's sort of a growing aspect of our mission. So we're so excited to be partnering with the Land Trust and the Library uh, for this workshop series. And I'll put our website over in the chat if anyone wants to check us out. And uh, Julia will be giving Giving a rundown on the land trust. Yeah, hi. So, um, good afternoon. Welcome everyone to this virtual workshop. It's really good to see a lot of familiar faces and names up on the Zoom screen. Um, and thank you, Hazel and Carrie. So, my name is Julia St. Clair. I am the Agricultural Programs Manager at the Brunswick Thompson Land Trust. So, part of my job is overseeing the Tom Settlemeyer Community Garden in Brunswick. Um, I recognize a lot of you from the community garden, but if you haven't visited the community garden yet, we welcome you to come in the spring. We have a plot program. We have the common good garden, which grows produce for um, food security efforts. We have tons of volunteer activities and a lot of different ways to get involved in the garden. Um, it's a great space to be able to learn from others, to grow flowers, grow produce. Um, and I think there's really something for everyone in the garden. It's also just a public space. So come and have your lunch there sometime. We welcome you to the space. Um, so this workshop series every year, the Brunswick Topsom Land Trust offers this winter workshop series. And it's really our way of keeping everyone who loves gardening excited about gardening all throughout the winter, which is our quiet time here in the Northeast. Um, this year, we're really excited. We're doing six workshops in collaboration with Growing to Give and Curtis Memorial Library. And I want to give a big thank you to Camden National Bank for sponsoring this workshop series. So last week, we kicked off the workshop series with a working with acorns workshop. 
Um, and next month we have coming up Invasive Jumping Worms 101 and Processing Elderberries. Both workshops will be in person at Curtis Memorial Library, and I hope that you'll join us for those as well. Just please go ahead and register in advance, um, either through BTLT's website or Curtis Memorial Library's website. So for today's workshop, we are hoping to give folks the information, the tools, and the excitement to make their gardens more pollinator-friendly spaces. And really our goal is broadening our understanding of pollinators beyond honeybees with a special focus on the pollinators we have um, right here that are native to Maine. So we hope this workshop inspires you in your garden and we invite you to get engaged at the Tom Settlemeyer Community Garden. Um, we are going to have four speakers today. Um, we're gonna hear from Emily Baisden, and then we're going to hear from a panel of speakers who are from the Tom Settlemeyer Community Garden. So Emily Baisden will start off this workshop with a presentation. Emily works for the Wild Seed Project, and prior to that, she served as the entomologist and educator at the Coastal Maine Botanical Gardens. She has an extensive background in horticulture and environmental education and focuses largely on using native plants to support food webs and biodiversity. So I'm going to hand it over to Emily to kick off her presentation. I invite you all, if you have questions, um, go, go ahead and drop them in the chat, but we will not be addressing questions until the end. So also feel free to take notes and save your questions um, till the end. We'll have plenty of time for all of our speakers to be able to address them, but we wanna make sure we're getting our presentations out to you as well. So hold on to your questions or share them in the chat. And um, Emily, I'm gonna hand it over to you. Great, thanks Julia. All right, share my screen. All right, can everybody see that all right? Wonderful. All right. Thanks, everybody. Um, I'm excited to be here today uh, supporting Brunswick. I'm a Brunswick resident myself, I'm here to talk about not just honeybees, the native pollinators and native plants needed to support them in our gardens. Um, so my background is in entomology and wildlife conservation. Um, so we're going to get to talking about some fun stuff here. But before I get going, um, Wild Seed Project always reads a land acknowledgement at the beginning of all of our programs. So I'm going to read that first. Um, Wild Seed Project is located within ancestral Wabanaki territory, now called Maine. We recognize the inherent sovereignty of the tribes of the Wabanaki, the people of the Dawn, the Abenaki, the Houlton Band of Maliseet Indians, the Mi'kmaq Nation, the Penobscot Nation, and the Passamaquoddy Tribe. We support their continued work for justice, self-determination, and decolonization. The work of Wild Seed Project is necessary precisely because of the ongoing violence of settler colonialism. The exploitative practices of European colonizers, which continue to this day, are directly responsible for the displacement of the native plants that form the foundation of local food webs that we are working to restore. What does it mean to build and rebuild reciprocal relationships with people, plants, fungi, soil, water, and air? Reestablishing resilient ecosystems in which all forms of life can thrive is one piece of deconstructing colonial legacy. As we do our work at Wild Seed Project, we are clear this knowledge and information did not start nor will it end with us. The resources we share are gathered from many teachers, both human and non-human. We encourage you to learn more about the historical and present day relationships of indigenous communities to the place you live and to join us in supporting indigenous led efforts to protect the land, water, plants and creatures among us. Um, that website nativelands.ca is a really useful source if folks are interested in looking into um, more about the tribes that were in their areas. Awesome, thanks. So let's just talk a little bit about what to expect in this talk. It's it's pretty broad. Um, we're gonna talk about why not to put all of our attention on honeybees um, and why should we should focus on supporting our native pollinators. We're gonna go over some of the bees of Maine, really just getting to know some common families in general. There's gonna be some ID information in there, but what I really want people to focus on is uh, the massive diversity we have of other pollinators um, and how wide ranging their habits are. Um, we think of a lot of bees like the honeybees as being social, but most of these bees are solitary and have very, very specific specialized behaviors that they engage in. So I really want people to be focusing on that. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about wasps. I encourage everyone to think right now about how they feel about wasps. 
um, and what kind of reaction that word gives them. Uh, and I'm going to talk about some really important charismatic species, and hopefully I can shift some thinking about wasps and get people to love them as much as I do. <laughs> um, and then I'll get into some tips and tricks to uh, gardening for pollinators and other beneficial insects. So first off, you know, we, we know that supporting native pollinators supports production. Um, we talk about blueberries a ton in Maine, um, but really any flowering plant requires pollination to be able to set fruit and seed production. Uh, and a lot of those plants require insects for that pollination. Uh, blueberries are a really good example that are often species that are pollinated um, by bringing in honeybees. Uh, but really the best pollinators of blueberries are the native bees that evolved with blueberries over millennia. Um, blueberries require what's called buzz pollination um, where the bee holds on to those little bell shaped flowers um, and shakes that pollen out of them. And honeybees don't do that. So they're not the best at pollinating these plants. They just tend to be the things that are trucked in. Um, so not only does supporting native pollinators support um, food production, but it also supports uh, other beneficial insects and ends up supporting greater food webs. So when we plant and engage in the management strategies to support pollinators, we often end up supporting things like parasitoids and predators. Often these are actually dual things. So a lot of insects are predators in one stage of their life and then are pollinators in another stage of their life. Um, and just having a balanced food web really helps build community stabilization. Um, if you have a whole good working food web, um, you can grow plants like in this picture is an apple, it's a non-native plant, um, and it's being protected by a predatory stink bug um, feeding on a caterpillar that would have been eating those leaves. So we wanna try to really build community stabilization and thinking of gardening with insects in mind. So I'm gonna get into some tips and tricks just for insect identification as you work towards uh, getting to be an entomologist yourself. Um, we can practice with macro photography. Uh, we all have iPhones or smartphones now and they're actually getting better and better and better at taking pictures, especially with macro photography, which can really help with IDing insects later on. Um, I encourage people to use the video part and freeze frames on an insect, especially a lot of our pollinators who are quite active and they fly around. Um, it's hard to just get one shot and to have enough uh, in that shot to be able to ID the insect. So using a video and freezing multiple frames to get kind of the whole body of the insect helps. Um, you can use all sorts of guides. There's some really great ones and reputable ID apps. There's a lot of ID apps out there. A lot of them are not great, um, but iNaturalist and Seek are really wonderful. And then bugguide.net is a great website that can also help with IDing. Um, it has a lot of keys. Um, when you're trying to ID things in the field, it's really important to watch for behavior. So like where is pollen being carried? Um, what kind of food is being used, whether it's pollen or prey items? How is the insect flying? What time of year is hugely important? Um, how is it nesting? Uh, all sorts of behavioral things. And then of course, general shape, size, and color patterns. Um, a lot of insect um, entomology has involved a lot of extractive ways of identifying insects where you collect them, you kill them, and you bring them back to a lab, and you use a microscope to check wing venation and tiny little dimples in the bodies of the insects. Um, so I encourage people to not do that unless they're trying to study really specific things. Um, but getting an idea of general size, shape, and color pattern can be really helpful. Um, where wings are held, looking at antenna length, um, where the how the legs are carried or placed are all really useful ways to help with insect ID. So let's talk about bees. <laughs> um, Maine is home to 270 species of bee. There's so many bees out there worldwide um, and they tend to be specialized on lots and lots of different plants, but most of them are pollination specialists. So they're doing the bulk of the plant pollinating um, out there. Some of those species are eusocial. That's a word you'll hear a lot in insect life. Um, that just means they have advanced social organization where a single female or cast produces the offspring and then non-reproductive individuals kind of cooperate and work together to care for the young. 
and protect the nest. Often these social species tend to be a little bit more aggressive than the solitary ones. But most of our bees, most of those 270 bees are what are called solitary bees. Um, it's one queen raising up a nest on her own. Um, most species nest underground. Some can be fairly particular in what kind of soil or what kind of substrate they're um, excavating their nests in. Most are annual, which means they only have one life cycle a year. Um, and all of them, the larvae are provisioned with nectar and pollen. Um, adults tend to only feed on nectar, um, but the larvae need that nectar as a high quality sugar source um, to give energy. And then pollen is a really important protein source. Um, pollen's actually more protein rich than beef. Uh, so it's really important for the growth and development for larvae. They all have these modified mouth parts for nectar feeding um, that you'll hear referred to as tongues, and a lot of ID can help with um, what tongue shape they have, whether it's a long tongue or a short tongue. Um, and most of them have some sort of modified part on their body for collecting pollen. It might be called a scopa or a curbicula, all sorts of fun words. Um, but a lot of ID is, is where they're holding that pollen and if they have modified um, body parts for that. So with that, we can talk quickly about the anatomy of the bee. The biggest thing you're going to hear about are the three segments, and that's for all insects. You've got the head, the thorax, and the abdomen. Um, a lot of bee identification has to do with thorax shape or color or abdomen um, sections and the colors on them. Um, and then also the legs, where the pollen is being carried on the legs, if they are a species that carries pollen on their legs. And then just a quick note about stingers. Um, only female bees have stingers. So if you've ever been stung by anything, it's only gonna be a female that goes for wasps, that goes for ants, that's the whole hymenoptera. Um, the stinger is part of the ovipositor. So only females can have that ability. So before I get into some of the native bees and wasps and fun pollinators we have, I'm gonna talk quickly my spiel about uh, honeybees. Um, so honeybees are a really fascinating group. They are a eusocial group. They can live, the hive can live for several years, which is rare for a lot of bee species, um, but they are not native to North America. They're likely native to Northern Africa and to Eurasia. Um, and they came to North America around the 17th century. And when they were brought over by European colonists, um, they were not brought over for pollination. Um, we had plenty of native pollinators doing that. We did not know back then that honeybees could be used for pollination. Um, the major things they were used for were as a sweetener because they produced that honey. And at the time there wasn't a large global sugar trade. So it was really important to have that sugar available to make things like mead and other important um, sweeteners. And then of course, wax. Um, it's a really useful thing, especially back then for things like candles, for things like waterproofing. We still use wax for a lot of um, products. So those were really the important reasons why we brought bees. There was no thought about using them as pollinators. And then as we, our habitats really kind of went to the destructive end of things um, and large scale agriculture was brought into our country, then um, honeybees were used more and more for pollination. Uh, and that's really just because a lot of native bee populations disappeared. And even more so because you can actually farm these bees. Um, they're one of the only bees that you can ratchet strap to a truck and bring into an area that's been um, highly sprayed with pesticides and things like that. Uh, have them go pollinate that plant and then truck them back to wherever you were keeping them. Um, and because of that, they, they're really used for utilitarian kind of use of farming. Um, I always use the little slogan, basically, a lot of people want to save the bees and they think using honeybees are going to work. But we hear that this slogan of using honeybees to save the bees is kind of like using chickens to save the birds. Um, they're a fascinating species, but they are livestock. They are facing their own problems, even in native places where they populate. Um, and a lot of those problems are similar to what other species are focusing are lacking here with habitat destruction and climate change and things like that. Um, another important thing to note about honeybees is just that um, they also have 
a lot of diseases that can be brought into uh, native populations of native bees. Um, they live in, you know, congregate living situations, as we know, uh, can be issues. So when you have tens of thousands of bees, um, disease can run rapidly through them, uh, and they spread those diseases by visiting flowers. Um, and if other bees go to visit those flowers and get that um, diseased bee poop on them, it can really hurt them. They can also be fairly aggressive foragers um, in places where there isn't enough forage for them. They can um, fight with other bees and can be in a detriment to native bees. So it's important to note, if you have high quality forage and really healthy bees, they don't tend to be as much of an issue. Um, it just gets to be an issue uh, down the line, especially if we are only focusing on this as our pollinator. So let's talk about some of our native bee species. So I'm gonna go over some families. Um, I'm not gonna cover everything in every slide just for sake of time. Um, but the first family I'm gonna talk about are the sweat bees. Um, this is the family Helictidae. I'm gonna cover a few different genera uh, that are really common. Um, most of these bees nest underground. Some of them nest in rotten logs. Most of them are solitary. Um, some will nest in big groups, but they're not social. So they're not defending large areas. So they tend to be um, very unaggressive and be really unlikely to get stung by something like this. There's a handful of kleptoparasites. That's a term you're going to hear a lot throughout this program. Uh, those are bees that lay their eggs in other bees' nests um, and use their uh, provisions to raise their young. This group tends to be small and slender. They have a wide range of hair, hairiness, <laughs> um, but many of them are this like kind of metallic green and they can be split into the different genuses. They tend to be generalist foragers um, and they carry their pollen on their legs or their thorax. So that'll be the most furry areas you'll find on these bees. They tend to be active in midsummer to late fall and they are attracted to sweat as the name implies. So if you ever have a small bee on you um, lapping away at your sweat, it's probably a helicted. So the metallic green sweat bee group, there's like four genera involved in them. Um, they all nest underground except for that guy in the bottom right there, the green sweat bee um, that lives in soft cavities of dry wood. Um, it's they're often in large groups, so you'll see a lot of these little metallic guys flying around. Um, they tend to be medium sized, maybe about the size of a honeybee, maybe a little smaller. Um, a lot of them are these really shiny colors. They all have some green on the thorax, which helps um, for identifying them. And they all car carry their pollen on their hind legs. And once again, they're attracted to sweat. Uh, the other genus are the small sweat bees, very similar looking, um, but it's a really big genus. There's about 52 species in Maine, so there's a lot of them. Remember, folks, we're trying to focus on the fact that there's just so much really cool diversity. I, I'm not going to test anybody, so we don't have to uh, worry too much about remembering each genus. Um, these guys tend to be small, slender, and metallic. Um, they one of the easiest ways to tell them from the next genus that I'm going to talk about is that they have these light color bands um, at the top of each abdominal segment. Um, that's a good way to tell them apart from this next group, the Helictus. Uh, these guys are the dark sweat bees, also attracted to sweat, um, small to medium size, but you can see those light bands are at the bottom of each abdominal segment. So that's just kind of one of the many tricks you can help kind of narrow down at least to genus of species. There's about six species of in um, Eastern North America or in Maine. So the last group in this family I'm going to talk about are the cuckoo sweat bees. Um, this is one of those kleptoparasites. Best way to tell a kleptoparasite is that it doesn't have as much hair as the other bees. That's because it doesn't need to collect pollen to provision its nests. It's using other bees to do that. They tend to be parasites of other helictids. Um, and it can be helpful with IDing them. They all have these dark heads and thoraxes and then kind of the reddish abdomens. Um, they do feed on nectar, so they do end up pollinating other plants. Um, a lot of people get heated about the idea of any kind of cuckoo animal, an animal that will use its uh, other animals' nests. Um, it's just what they do. They've evolved to do that. These guys are also pollinators, so they're also important to have in our gardens. So the next family, this is a really cool one. These are the megachylids. Um, they're the leaf cutter and resin bees. Uh, there's about 49 species in Maine. 
Um, most of them are solitary, but you can see lots of them in an area. Uh, many of them are pollinators of important crops, um, and some of them have even been domesticated for crop pollination. Um, they all nest in these hollow tubes or cavities in wood. Um, and they all, the best way to tell a megachylid from any other bee is that they carry their pollen in their abdomen. So you can see the bee in this picture kind of has a stout rounded kind of almost flat um, abdomen. Uh, and that's because it's carrying its pollen under there. So it's kind of a very different shape from a lot of our other native bees. The megachyli, the leafcutter bees in this family, um, tend to be medium to large, kind of chunky bees. Um, they have that round body to allow them to carry that uh, pollen under their abdomen. Um, and they have these really kind of big pincher looking things that are their mandibles. And that's just so that they can cut those holes in their leaves. So if you ever have a garden with a bunch of um, these like perfect circular holes in the leaf along the edge margin of a leaf, you've got a good sign for having leaf cutter bees, um, which are really cool. And they use that um, leaf to wrap around their larva and encase their brood to, to protect them um, while they're nesting. Um, they tend to be uh, generalists on plants, but there are a couple species that specialize on certain groups of plants. Um, so that can help you narrow down what species. If you're, if you're looking at a specific species of plant that's being visited by clearly some sort of megachylid, um, it can help narrow down the species for you. Uh, most are active through summer uh, and into early fall. And we've got about 14 species in Maine. So there's quite a few. Um, the other group are the Osmia. These are the mason bees. Uh, they tend to be kind of another medium-sized bee. They tend to have kind of metallic, shiny colors. Um, the big difference with them is they have these really round, kind of bulbous abdomens and really round heads. They also have pretty large mandibles, and that's because they collect um, like mud and other plant matter to fill in their brood cells. Um, and they will use those artificial nesting boxes that people um, build for bees, uh, but they'll also just use cavities in wood if, if it's provided or hollow stems of plants. Um, they tend to be more active in spring. So that also helps uh, kind of narrow down what species they are. Um, and they tend to be using those early spring pollinating plants plants, um, so like fruit trees and things like that. Um, people will use them in commercial fruit production because they're pretty active early on in the season. So the last bee I'm gonna talk about in this group um, is a non-native bee. It's the European wool carter bee, uh, super common. I see them a lot in gardens around me. That's just one that's good for people to get to know. They're fairly large, chunky bees. They've got these black and yellow spots. Um, and they're named after this behavior of scraping hairs from plants and using it to kind of line their nests. Uh, they can be an issue at certain times, um, especially in low forage areas, because um, they can, can be very territorial and can injure other native pollinators. So it's a good one to get to know. Um, I see them quite regularly. So the next group are the Andrenids. They're one of my personal favorites. Uh, partially just because they're one of the first active bees in spring. Um, so you'll see them flying around the soil layer or the leaf layer um, early in the spring, checking out for uh, early season um, plants. So some of our uh, spring ephemerals and things like that are pollinated by these andrenids. It is a really, really large family. Um, they come in all sorts of shapes and sizes. Um, often they have these little stripes. They almost look like mini honeybees sometimes. Um, and they tend to carry their pollen really high up on their leg. You can see in this picture, she's got a lot of really dense furs very high up on their leg. And that can help with IDing these guys. Um, the most common genus yeah. in this family are the Andrews. <laughs> There's over 50 species in Maine, so there's a lot of them. Um, and they're those early, early spring uh, to early summer species. Um, they tend to be dark with the stripes on their abdomen. Um, one of the best ways to tell them apart is that they're kind of teardrop shaped abdomens. And then they have this thorax, this picture is, does a good job at showing it that kind of tapers into a neck kind of looking area. Um, 
They are solitary and ground nesting, and many of them are pollen specialists. So they really need a lot of our native perennials. They've evolved over millennia to need certain species of plants, including a lot of shrubs and a lot of crops like blueberries. And then Perdita, this is the other group I'm gonna talk about in here. There's only one species, the eight spotted fairy bee, um, but it's a good one to get to know because they're, they are gonna be the really tiny bees, stripy bees that you see on like goldenrods and other aster family plants. Um, they also nest in sandy soil sites. Um, and it's really cool if you can find one of these little tiny guys digging holes. So that gets me to this very, very large family, Apidae. Um, this includes some of our most charismatic, well-known bees, it's the bumblebees, the carpenter bees, the digger bees, squash bees, longhorn bees, that also includes some cuckoo bees. Um, and of course the honey bees are also in this family. It's a hugely diverse family. They do everything from super social organizations to very solitary and everything in between. Um, and they have a really wide range of nesting and foraging behaviors. But like I said, it includes some of our most um, common and recognizable and beloved bees. Um, so that includes the bombus, the bumblebees. Um, they tend to be medium to large bees, pretty recognizable with their um, fuzzy yellow and black bodies. They are eusocial, so they're a social species that forms large to small colonies with one queen. Super important pollinators um, because they're active for much longer in a season than a lot of other bees. They come out in very early spring and are active all the way through fall. They really need to have blooms available throughout the whole growing season. Um, there's some special things about these guys because they're so big and chunky. Um, they can forage in cool temperatures. These females can do this um, vibrating thing with their wings to warm them up so that they're able to fly in much colder temperatures than other insects. Um, and they're able to fly in rain, which is also pretty rare for a lot of insects. They tend to have long tongues so they can access a lot of different nectars. And because they're so strong and big, they're able to get into some of these really special plants like the closed gentian in that picture there, where they're able to pr pry those petals apart um, that some of our other bees wouldn't be able to access. Um, they carry their pollen in specialized structures cor called corbicula. You could see the uh, tricolored bee in the bottom. Um, they'll pack a whole bunch of pollen into those corbicula, and that's a, a good sign that you've got one of these bumblebees. Um, they tend to nest in abandoned rodent holes, um, rock walls, really anywhere that's protected. We've got 16 species in Maine, so it's a good goal to try to get to every species if you can. But the two most common are the common eastern bumblebee, which is probably that one up top. She's foraging in that gentian. And then the tricolored bumblebee um, at the bottom there, uh, often confused with the rusty patch. It's good to get to know that species. It is an endangered species. Um, I have have not found any in Maine, um, but it's always good to keep a lookout. Uh, they're only going to have the rusty patch at the top part of their abdomen. There's not going to be the two uh, bands like this tricolored has. So just a quick important note about um, the way bumblebees form their colonies. Uh, new colonies are formed each year, uh, unlike honeybees that will keep a colony several years where um, an inseminated queen will emerge from hibernation and start finding a nesting site. Often that's one of those ab abandoned rodent dens um, and she'll start creating these little wax cups and laying eggs in them. And as her daughters emerge, they really take over a lot of those foraging duties um, and she'll just continue to lay eggs. And then in the autumn, she'll start to raise up uh, new queens and male bees. And as those become adults, they'll fly off and mate with other bees. Um, and then the only bees of that whole colony that are gonna survive into the next year are those newly mated queens. And they'll start that whole cycle over again the next year. Um, so it's really important that we think of full year habitat protection for bumblebees. And I'll talk about that later on too. So the next bee I just wanna talk about are the squash bees. Um, there's only one species in Maine, but if you're an avid gardener um, and you grow a lot of squash, you've probably come across these guys. Um, the males tend to sleep inside the squash blossoms and it's just about the cutest thing anyone's ever seen because they'll fall asleep kind of like holding hands um, curled in the base of these squash blossoms. Um, but they tend to be these kind of orange yellow heads uh, and thoraxes with these black and white stripes on their abdomens. Um, and one of the easier ways you can tell them apart 
part, if you're not seeing them on a squash, uh, is they kind of have these uh, angular protruding shape shaped faces. Um, they're very, very cute. <laughs> And then the Melisodes, these are the longhorned bees. Um, they are kind of a medium-sized bee. I love this picture um, because it shows a lot of the really useful identification tools for this bee. Um, females often have these really pretty bluish uh, eyes. Um, they also carry their pollen on these really, really thick shaggy hairs on their legs. So they kind of look like they're wearing little leg warmers or something like that. Um, a lot of them are pollen specialists also within the aster family. Um, so they tend to be active when those host plants are blooming. And most of our asters are blooming from midsummer into fall. So that tends to be when you see these, uh, this group of bees. So the next one, a lot of people have heard about these, the xylocopa. These are the large carpenter bees. Um, we have one species in Maine. It's the eastern carpenter bee. Um, I love talking about this because a lot of people don't like it <laughs> um, because it, it will excavate holes and decks and things like that. Um, they're large black and yellow bees, but they are really important pollinator um, plants. They collect pollen on uh, hairs on the hind leg rather than corbicula. So that's a big difference between bumblebees. Uh, they can be confused with them pretty regularly because they're large black and yellow bees. Best way to tell a carpenter bee from a bumblebee, though, is their abdomens aren't very hairy. They tend to be shiny um, and hairless. Um, Males can be defensive, which is kind of funny. If you've ever experienced uh, carpenter bees kind of buzzing around your face, it was probably a male. <laughs> um, they tend to be like that. They can't hurt you. So they're, they're they like to say they're all buzz and no bite. Um, and a lot of times they have a little white patch on their head. Uh, as long as they're not in your deck, they are not a problem. <laughs> they're doing their thing. Um, even if they're in your deck, they're probably not gonna cause too much damage. And that brings me to probably the cutest, arguably cutest bee in my mind, um, is the Serotina. They're the small carpenter bees. So they're one of those pith nesting bees. Um, they'll excavate the soft insides of um, soft stemmed plants um, and layer their larva and lay their eggs into those plants. They tend to be very, very, very tiny um, and still have that kind of shimmery, iridescent, metallic color. Um, they're a really cool bee. If you ever get the chance to see one excavating a stem, it's really impressive because they're so small and they're able to do a lot of work in a very short amount of time. So the last bee in this group that I'll talk about are the nomad, nomada bees. They're another cuckoo bee, another um, kleptoparasite. Uh, they can often be confused with wasps. Like all kleptoparasites, they're not as hairy. Um, and that's because they don't have to carry pollen to provision their nests. They lay their eggs in other bees' nests. Um, but I wanted to talk about this species just because there's this group, because there's 27 species in Maine. So there's a lot of them. They're pretty uh, common um, and they are pollinating because they are nectar feeding insects. So I believe this is the last group of bees I'm gonna talk about. These are the Kalidids, the cellophane plaster or, or masked bees. Um, they nest underground or in stems. They're usually active in early spring. They're probably the number one group that you could mistake for an andrenid. They're another early spring uh, active bee. They are solitary. Uh, the big difference between these guys and other bees is that the females all line their nests with some sort of cellophane-like substance. It's produced from glands in their head mixed with their saliva, and it helps waterproof and um, protect their uh, cells for their eggs. Um, Calides is the genus of cellophane bees. There's about 10 species in Maine. Um, many of them are specialized foragers on certain types of plants. Um, they all nest underground in well-drained soil, uh, sandy soil. And like I said, they line their uh, nests with this cellophane-like substance. Um, like I was saying before, they're really similar to andrenids in look. The easiest way to tell them apart, this is another great picture that shows it really well, is that their face shape and their eye placement kind of gives them like a heart-shaped face if you look at them kind of straight on. So that's the important thing about when we're trying to ID these bees is to really take your time and be patient and, and watch them, watch them see what they're doing, watch how they move. Um, 
And these all have this specialized two lobe tongue. This whole family, I think, has it. Uh, and that helps them build those nests, those plaster nests. The other genus I'll talk about are the masked bees, the hylias. Um, there's 10 species in Maine. They're very, very small. Um, they tend to be not very hairy, even though they're not uh, kleptoparasites. Um, and they can be confused with mason wasps uh, just because they kind of have this black and white similar uh, markings. Um, but they also have the two lobed tongue and nest with these in small cavities and plant stems um, that are waterproofed by that cellophane. They tend to be short tongued, unlike some bumblebees. So they tend to be on open or composite flowers and things like that. Easy to access pollen and nectar sources. So that's just the tip of the iceberg of bees. You know, I wasn't going to cover 270 species of bee in under an hour. <laughs> um, but let's talk quickly about wasps. Um, there's about 18,000 species in North America. We're gonna focus on the wasps that are associated with flowers. Um, and I'm just gonna talk about some major groups that people will see quite regularly. Um, one of the big things I love to talk about wasps is really how they, they're they the ancestors of bees and even reverse that bees are really just hairy wasps. Um, wasps evolved before angiosperms, so before flowering plants. Um, and when flowering plants came along, Wasps started to evolve towards using this new resource. They started growing hair, getting specialized structures to be able to use these nectar and pollen sources that started to happen. Um, so if you're thinking about the evolutionary tree, it was wasps and then bees, and then they continued to speci speciate out. Um, so if, if there's one thing that's gonna get you to love wasps is just to think of them as bees. <laughs> But they're, they're super important to our ecosystems. Um, many of them are predators or parasitoids that specialize on a certain pest. Um, many of them, if their larvae are predators, the adults feed on nectar and end up becoming really important pollinators. Um, most of them, just like bees, have really important habitat needs. So they require a specific prey. They visit a certain number of flowers. They need the right types of nesting sites. Um, most of them are solitary and non-aggressive. So with the 30,000 ID'd worldwide, there's probably thousands and thousands more we haven't ID'd. And they go from everything from the tiniest little fairy bees to the largest um, wasps that you can find. Um, many of them can't be identified without a microscope, so we're not going to worry too much about those. But like I said, they are the most important pest control. A lot of people like to think of um, birds and mammals and things like that being the things that are controlling the would-be pests in our gardens, um, but really wasps are doing the majority of that. The number one control against uh, caterpillars that would become pests and stink bugs and grasshoppers and all those um, would-be garden pests are really wasps. So we can love them just for that on top of them being pollinators. So we're gonna talk about the specids. Those are the thread waste wasps. They include uh, mud wasps, mud daubers, digger wasps, uh, huge variety of sizes um, and habits. There are about 52 species in Maine. Um, and most of those species provision nests with a specific arthropod prey. So their larvae are feeding on very specific species that they need. And the adults are pollinators and nectar feeding. Um, they can nest uh, below ground in sandy sites. Some of them nest in those mud tubes that they build. Um, and sometimes they'll even nest in some of those hollow stemmed plants. Most of them, as the name implies, have this really narrow uh, first abdominal segment. Um, they've got that, that kind of skinny, skinny abdomen. Two species I'm gonna talk about quick are the great golden digger and the great black wasp. Um, they have similar habits. They're some of the larger wasps in this group. Um, it's likely you've come across them. A lot of people uh, are scared when they come across them, um, but they are solitary species. All they want to do is collect katydids and provision the holes that they dig with them. Um, I've spent a lot of time around these wasps and I've never been stung by one. You'd have to really, really aggravate. You'd have to like grab it and squeeze it for it to sting you. Um, so they're really kind of the, the large dogs of the world, the bee world, they're not gonna hurt, um, but they are quite large. And if you ever get a chance to follow one that's carrying a Katie did, um, they're really good at excavating holes and it's really impressive to watch them fling their sand around. 
So the next family are the crabronids. These are the square-headed wasps and the sand wasps. Um, once again, they feed their larvae on prey. Um, that prey can is mostly dependent on species, and it can be anything from aphids to spiders. So there's this huge range of prey that they use. There's over 30 species in Maine, um, and most of them excavate holes in the ground, once again, with sandy sites. And they tend to be solitary um, and non-aggressive and important pollinators. So they are not gonna hurt you. Uh, two species in that group that I really wanna talk about, one's the four-banded sand wasp. This is just a really great example of what a lot of these wasps look like. They tend to have these kind of uh, white abdomen lines. The best way to tell a lot of these species apart is looking at those spots and seeing the shape of them. Um, but this species feeds on our true bugs, so they're predating um, stink bugs, squash bugs, other sorts of potential pest bugs for their, their young, and of course the adults are nectar feeding. Um, the next species I really want to talk about are the cicada killers. Um, I always try to talk about cicada killers just because uh, when the whole murder hornet thing was happening, um, a lot of people were killing cicada killers because they were afraid they were that um, species. They are not. Um, the only thing they feed on are cicadas. They are one of our largest wasps, maybe our largest wasp in Maine. Um, the female can carry about two times her body weight, which is really impressive um, for any animal. Um, but they're huge nectar feeders, so you see them on, on plants a lot, and they can scare people because they can be quite hefty, um, but they're, they're really, really non-aggressive. Once again, you'd have to like really squeeze it for it to hurt you. Um, and they're they're just a really cool wasp. Um, they tend to have these like rusty orange markings on their thorax and on their wings. And then they have this kind of ivory colored um, lumped lines along their abdomens. So we should all love cicada killers. They're very impressive. They can be shocking when you see them dragging a cicada along, but um, cicadas spend most of their time underground feeding on plant roots. So it's really important to have something that specializes on them to keep their populations in check. So the last group are the Vespids. <laughs> um, saved the best for last, right? Uh, they include hornets, wa uh, potter wasps, mason wasps. Um, they tend to be the group that people don't really like, um, but there's so many of them. There's over 20 species in Maine, and the handful that people come in contact with that they don't like are tend to be the minority. Um, best way to tell them is they hold their wings in that classic yellow jacket um, manner, um, and the top of their thorax kind of has this U-shaped um, area if you're looking at them from above. I'm going to talk about the two subfamilies that are common in Maine. The first one are the Eumenines. These are the potter wasps. They're a solitary species. They are not aggressive. Um, they spend, they nest above ground in pre-existing cavities, hollow stems, logs, and some will build their nest in those perfect little clay pots that they build. Um, a lot of people, I get a lot of pictures sent to me of these little pots and I always get excited because it's really cool um, to watch them lay their eggs and, and build these really amazing um, clay pots. Uh, they prey on caterpillars for the most part. Um, a lot of them are specialized on specific caterpillars um, and tend to be uh, crop pest caterpillars, which is really great. Um, the species here is the four-toothed mason wasp. And then another subfamily are the vespins, the yellow jackets, and the hornets. So that gets me into some of those uh, more aggressive species. So most of these eusocial species tend to be a little bit more aggressive than others. Uh, that's because there's a whole bunch of individuals guarding a really important resource that they're building. They're guarding their young. Um, there's a lot of them in one area. So they've, they've kind of got this job to guard this nest. Um, these guys have annual co colonies. So they'll build up these large colonies, but only the new queen uh, overwinters. Um, they're super common. One of the big sources of confusion I hear when people are talking about wasps is confusing them with paper wasps. Um, so these guys, the yellow jackets, create these really large hives, can be really large hives, um, that are covered in this paper envelope. Um, 
They're predators of a huge wide range of insects um, and the adults feed on nectar. They will also go for your ice cream in the winter or in the summertime. Um, so you have to keep an eye on not accidentally sticking your hand on one of them. Um, but it includes all those yellow jackets and those bald faced hornets. And the, the big group that they get confused with, um, especially those, those hives that they build, are these guys, the Palestines, the paper wasps. So it's a little bit of a confusing name. So we like to think paper wasps build these paper envelope covered nests. That's not actually the case. These guys um, have kind of an open nest. They're not, it's not coated in that paper envelope. Um, and they have sort of a, a weird primitive eusocial order um, where they, a whole bunch of females will emerge and they'll all be laying eggs and they'll eventually kind of establish a hierarchy with one main egg layer, um, but they'll all be defending these hives. Um, these are the ones that love to lay them right where you're going to forget they're there, not know they're there and bump into them. Um, and then they'll be defending their nests. Um, they're really important biocontrol agents. They feed on a lot of crop um, caterpillars. So they really like like cabbage moths and things like that. Um, that can be a real issue in our gardens. Um, this example is the northern paper wasp. I do want to point out this Vespin here, um, you can see there's one exit hole. And that's the case for a lot of bees. A lot of them will use just one flight path. And if it's in an area that isn't really in the way of people, if you can just avoid that flight path, it's really unlikely to be stung by one of those bees unless you sit on it or step on it or something like that. So that gets me done with Hymenoptera. That's just the tip of the iceberg of Hymenoptera. Um, but it hopefully gave you a good idea of the massive amount of diversity that's in that group. Um, but it's so much more than just bees and wasps. Um, we've got our butterflies. There's about 120 species of butterfly in Maine. And then we've got thousands of moths. Moths, um, it's hard to know how many species there are in an area because a lot of them are tiny. A lot of our moths don't feed at all, but the ones that do feed are really important um, pollinators for a lot of specific plants. A lot of them are semi-specialized on certain nectar plants. So many beetles. Um, so insects are like the most diverse terrestrial animal. Within that, beetles are the most diverse of insects. Um, there's so many beetles that are important pollinators. We've got flower beetles. We've got these longhorn beetles. We've got what are called tumbling flower beetles. Um, this is Spirea alba. It's one of my favorite plants to look at pollinators on because I can look at one head of flowering Spirea alba and see like four different orders of insects using them. Um, and of course, we've got be uh, beetles that even look like bees doing a lot of pollinating. Um, and then there's these flies that, similar to wasps, have an awful lot of dual beneficial value. It's hard to see the fly in this picture because he is really. Um, well camouflaged on this Rudbeckia. Um, but we can see this other picture. If you look into the bottom right here, you see this uh, tall white aster humble is just covered in what are called surfid flies. Um, they're also called hover flies. Uh, you can tell that they hover around on plants. They'll also lick your skin sometimes in the summer. Um, but the uh, adults are really important nectar feeders and pollinators, but the larvae are voracious predators on aphids. So they kind of have that dual beneficial value that can be really useful when it comes to insects. All right. And of course, it's not just invertebrates. We've got hummingbirds and small mammals that do a lot of pollinating as well. So how can we support all of these crazy specialized insects? Um, there's a few pretty simple action steps we can take. One of them is just changing our maintenance strategies, shifting our priorities, seeing what's in our yards um, and in our gardens and using sustainable practices to promote those. Um, we can plant native species. Remember, so many of these animals are specialized, which means over millennia, they've come to only be able to use certain plants and those tend to be our native plants. Um, we can use these species to help provide that food, shelter and nesting areas. We can get really creative. We can use our space to provide that year round support to support the entire life cycle of these insects. And then lastly, we can really collaborate with others. We can create wildlife corridors and we can become advocates for these species um, and engage with other people doing good work. 
So if we want to think about rethinking our management practices with insects in mind, the few ways we can do that, the easiest is just buying and growing pesticide-free plants. Pesticides hurt insects. It's in the name. Every single pesticide will hurt insects. That includes organic pesticides. Um, I've talked to a lot of people who swear by using neem to keep aphids out. That's fine, but it's also going to keep any other insect out. So all pesticides are going to hurt insects. So we have to be aware of when we're using them and how we're using them, if we're going to use them. Um, Wild Seed Project has a kind of where to buy native plants list of people selling pesticide-free native plants, um, and you can always grow them yourself from seed. We've got a lot of um, resources on our website if you're interested in that as well. Um, the worst pesticides for bees and other pollinators, of course, are the neonicotinoids. They're a systemic pesticide. It goes in all parts of the plant, the leaves, the flower, the pollen, the nectar, and it can last for several years, um, and it affects bees quite uh, immensely neurologically. It makes it hard for them to nest um, and a whole bunch of other bad things. Another thing we can do is keep some open ground. I mean, if you think about how many of those species I talked about nest in ground, um, providing bare ground is really useful. And most of us have somewhere in our gardens that nothing will grow. <laughs> so it's nice to get to shift our thinking of, I can't get anything to grow here, but maybe that's actually good and beneficial and providing some habitat for these animals to be able to nest. We can also add species of plant that have these stems that can be excavated by those stem nesting bees, things like elderberry, joe pie weed, sumac, um, the mints, the cone flowers. There's a whole group of soft centered plants that um, these bees and wasps will nest in. And we can leave, when we plant those, we can leave that standing vegetation. There's this really useful um, system that Heather Holm and her lab have come up with of uh, how to create that stem nesting habitat. And it's really leaving those dead flower stalks over winter. Um, we can leave them for birds to eat the seeds and all sorts of things like that. And then the spring, if you must cut them back, cut them back between eight and 24 inches. These female bees will be starting to move around in the spring and find those stems and start stacking their uh, eggs and lar larva into them. Over the season, those plants will grow up. They're perennials. They'll grow up around those stems. You won't be able to see it anymore. It won't be unsightly. Um, and it'll provide a lot of protection and uh, a cooler nesting site for those animals. And then the fall, you let them go, let them overwinter in those stems for the spring for the to all start over again. So the next thing that we can do that's super, another easy management shift is just leaving the leaves. Um, somewhere down the line, people decided that it was really important that we remove all of our leaves from our um, plant beds in the fall and then mulch them like crazy in the spring. <laughs> um, you can avoid all of that by just leaving our leaves on the ground. Um, remember the bumblebees only go about two inches underground and they need that leaf litter to help protect them. But really so many insects and other uh, arthropods require leaf litter to survive a winter. A lot of people think that insects just die in the winter, um, but that's not true. They're alive in one of their life forms, whether it be uh, egg, larva, or pupil or adult form. Um, and a lot of them require leaf litter. A lot of them either have eggs in the leaf litter or um, are using that to protect their cocoons. Um, so it's really, really important that we leave that leaf litter. Try to not chip it. It also provides really good spring mulch for these plants. These plants need a nice layer of insulation um, and it helps with heave and all sorts of really useful garden things. when we think about what plants that we want to plant, we can think about um, getting a really diverse source of nectar and pollen. Um, remember, a lot of bees also will forage in shade. Um, so there's a lot of shade flowering plants we can think about um, having blooms throughout the growing season. So spring into fall blooming plants. Um, and having a really good diversity of flower shape. So having those open composite flowers mixed with tubular flowers for all the different tongue shapes um, and variability in pollinators. Um, just avoiding double flower cultivars. That's the biggest cultivar that's kind of a no-no for pollinators. They're those ones that have a lot and a lot of petals. The petal, the pistons and stamens have kind of been bred out or selected out um, to become petals instead. So there's no uh, way, there's any access to pollen or nectar in this type of plant. 
Um, and we can plant to support the full insect life cycle. So if we're choosing our plants, we need to think about who we want to feed. If we want to feed things like this snowberry clearwing moth um, to have it come pollinate our plants, we're gonna need to feed its larva. And its larva can only eat a small group of plants that includes snowberry and our um, native honeysuckle vines. Um, the term host plant is just a plant that serves as a food source as part of the life cycle of another organism. That's a term you'll hear a bunch when you're trying to grow for pollinators. Um, it's really important to provide, especially with butterflies and caterpillars, um, to provide that host plant for the caterpillar. We can also target our favorite pollinators. Um, if we want to attract hummingbirds, we want to use tubular shaped um, flowers. They really like red. They also really love um, things like jewelweed, um, any of the bee bombs. I don't even do hummingbird feeders anymore. They're way too much upkeep. Um, I just have a whole bunch of cardinal flower and jewelweed in my yard and I get a ton of hummingbirds every year. We can also think about what species attract the most and the bulk of our pollinators. Um, those tend to be the keystone species and for wildflowers that's goldenrods and asters. A lot of people groan when I say just plant goldenrods and asters because they think of them as being too aggressive for a garden setting. Um, but there's a huge number of goldenrods and asters out there and there's something for every kind of area from uh, shade to sun, wet to dry, um, and there's a whole bunch that are uh, great for a garden setting and won't outcompete other plants. Things like flax leaved aster, things like uh, blue wood aster. Um, I think there's some New England aster behind that. Zigzag goldenrod, blue stem goldenrod are all perfectly content in a garden setting. And then we can plant things like pollinator powerhouse cover crops. Um, anytime I have to do a pollinator talk, I try to squeeze in time for partridge pea. Uh, it's a really cool plant. Um, it's an annual. It will reseed quite re readily, but it's easy to pull if it ends up in a place you don't want it in. Um, it is both the host plant for uh, hair streak butterflies, um, but it's also got these really cool little suction cup like things uh, that are called extra floral nectaries. So it produces nectar um, not just on the flower, but also on the stem of the plant. So you'll attract things like um, ants and wasps and things like that, utilizing that nectar even when the plant is not in bloom. So with all of this, we can we can really support the full life cycle of an insect. And kind of the poster child for this uh, is the Baltimore checker spot butterfly. Um, great pollinator, beautiful butterfly, but she'll only lay her eggs on turtle head, um, which is another one of those plants that is mostly pollinated by bumblebees. They need to pry those leaves open to be able to get those nectar sources. The caterpillars feed in the early fall. Um, and then they overwinter as caterpillars in the leaf litter. So you have to leave that leaf litter. And then in the spring, the caterpillars will emerge and continue feeding and then pupate to repeat the process over again. So if we can think about that full life cycle, the host plant, the pollinator plants, um, and leaving our leaf litter and ma maintaining our properties to support them, we can do really good things. And through all of these actions, we can create these highly productive and beautiful gardens. This is a photo of a garden from one of our members at Wild Seed Project that's just loaded with so many blooms so that they're blooming really throughout the entire growing season and providing a massive amount of habitat. And lastly, you know, we can we can support our local and global advocacy groups, support your local land trust. Um, the Xerxes Society is um, one of our only uh, arthropod concert focused conservation organizations. Um, and we can engage in community science programs. iNaturalist allows scientists to look at what's happening with the species in your area. The Maine Bumblebee Atlas is tracking the bumblebees in Maine. Um, you can find bio blitzes in your area, engage in the Maine Biota Project. They're trying to find um, all the flora and fauna of Maine um, and just getting it into IDing insects in your habitats. There's also the Maine Entomological Society that can provide a lot of good information um, and helps to conserve animals, uh, insects. So there's so many useful reading sources out there. Uh, like I said, Heather Holm is kind of the, the queen of bees. <laughs> um, she also has really, really great wasp information. Her wasp book I'm really obsessed with right now. Um, but she has this website called pollinatorsnativeplants.com. If you're looking for good plant lists, this website has it. It's got really good posters, um, just a ton of information. Uh, and then of course, there's there's a plenty of other books and guides that we can use. Um, there's an online resource of the Bees of Maine that has a species checklist is 
um, that'll give you kind of historical and present day records of all the bees that we've found in Maine. And that's the end of that. If you're interested in learning more about growing these native plants, check out Wild Seed Project. Think about becoming a member. We've got three useful guides for um, growing native shrubs, uh, ground covers, and trees that all promote wildlife and pollinators. And that is it for me. Thanks. Awesome. Thank you so much, Emily. Um... And thank you for all the photos too. It's just really, really cool to be able to match the name to some of these pollinators that I see around the garden. Um, so again, we're gonna do a bunch of Q&A at the end, but we have a, another set of presentations. Um, so we are now gonna be hearing from some members of the Tom Settlemeyer Community Garden. We're gonna hear from Ellen Mailing, Joan Carney, and Barbara Murphy. So Ellen learned to garden with native and pollinator beneficial plants at the Tom Settlemeyer Community Garden and uses her project management and organizational skills to advance good causes, including the annual BTLT Taking Root Plant Sale. If you've ever been to the community garden, you've probably seen Ellen there. Um, she has a huge presence in the garden and can name just about every plant that um, is growing there. So Joan has been a plot holder in the Tom Settlemeyer Community Garden since 2014. She started with vegetables and herbs, and after a few seasons, um, she started planting native perennials to magnetize more pollinators to that part of the garden. And since then, it's grown into a pollinator plot. And um, when you're next to Joan's part of the garden, you can spot many of the pollinators that we just heard about from Emily. And Barbara has been involved with the Tom Settlemeyer Community Garden since its inception in 2012. At TCSG, she maintains a plot. She has worked as a mentor for new gardeners. She has volunteered as part of the perennial team and with the Common Good Garden. Several seasons ago, she started the process of transforming her Brunswick front yard from a weedy lawn into a garden of mostly native plants designed to attract pollinators. Um, so again, at the end of the presentation, we will have time for questions. Please feel free to drop those in the chat or take notes to save them for the end. And Ellen, I hand it over to you. Great. Thank you, Juliet, um, for the introduction, too. And I will just start to say I, I repatriated to Maine in 2016 and landed at the garden as a way to help me get connected with Maine and the community um, and the ecosystem. So I actually knew very little about any New England plants, native plants or whatever. And my approach has really been to start to develop um, the pollinator beds at the, at the garden as a combination of some really vibrant and diverse habitat, um, also providing a lot of uh, demonstration, you know, to people like we, I made little la you know, labels for the plants so that you can tell what they are. Um, and then also recognizing that we did have an opportunity to both grow inventory for our sale and also collect seeds from those um, uh, flowers and shrubs to be able to um, grow those over the long term. So I just wanted to give you a picture of everything that happens here at the Tom Settlemeyer Community Garden. It's an incredible, um, incredible space. And like I said, I didn't really, I kind of had those intentions around, you know, thinking what might happen, but I had no plan. You know, it. I sort of was able to buy, um, native plants from reputable sellers. Um, I'd buy them often at the end of the season when they were discounted. I did a lot of seed growing to see. I got um, contributions from other gardeners that um, I put in. So it really is a little bit of a haphazard, um, you know, uh, opportunistic type of approach, but it's been really fun. Um, I wanted to um, also share the, uh, okay slide here. Um, uh, the, so we see a lot of charismatic species of butterflies, particularly in the garden. Um, we have incredible monarch ha habitat, a number of different types, swarms of milkweed there. So that's, that's pretty exciting. Um, I did also though want to just highlight and just speaking to Emily's notion about those golden and black digger wasps. So I had you know, I was watching them feeding on the swamp milkweed. And I was like, huh, I've never seen anything like that before. I actually snapped a photo and sent it to the folks at Cooperative Extension. Um, it was a little bit of an easy way out. 
Um, but they were, you know, happy to see them. And the same with this salt marsh caterpillar um, that was unfamiliar to me um, and actually kind of unusual. In addition to the Pandora sphinx moth caterpillar down here, just really incredible specimen showed up after um, a grape um, was planted at this pergola we have at the garden. And I, I didn't, you know, they nest, they do their pupating on the ground, but it was a spectacular moment of curiosity. I, we had a bunch of um, gardeners there. We were just so excited about the whole thing. It was pretty awesome. Um, so I guess just in point, I also wanted to say, we do see a number of other types of habitat here. This um, red-tailed hawk, I think, was just sighted a few weeks ago at the garden. I think he was rummaging in our uh, weed pile for rodents um, and, of course, the heron, too. So it's just been, you know, there's in a sense of vibrancy that I think comes from having um, pollinator beneficial and native plants in this meadow ecosystem that really brings in a lot of great um, diverse forms of wildlife. And then um, lastly, I guess I'll just share a couple of things that um, one to Emily's point around, you know, starting from seed. This is a New York ironweed plant that I planted one of my first winters uh, with a winter sowing method. It's now towers above my head. I think it's eight feet tall. I don't know. Um, but it's a, a pretty um, spectacular accent to um, the garden land. And really, you know, like what can happen, right? Bringing in this, spir this spirit of experimentation and curiosity can really took, take, you know, this typical really dead lawn into um, a really vibrant habitat that will kind of create all sorts of magic um, moving forward. So, um, you know, it does take a while start small, but um, you can really make a big impact with just doing these um, types of projects in your own backyard. And and with that, I, I did want to um, turn it over to Joan next for sharing a little bit of her spectacular um, array of plants that she's got in her plots. Thank you, Ellen. So hi, everyone. It's great to have you all here and wonderful to see the interest in our community um, for pollinators and how we can welcome pollinators into our spaces. I'm Joan Carney and I have the good fortune to steward a bit of space in the Tom Settlemeyer Gardens since um, 2014. Um, Ellen had already shown you this map, but I added a big red arrow to the area of the garden that I'm going to introduce you to. And as was mentioned in 2014, I started with vegetables. And then in 2017, I started converting over. And one thing that I certainly learned was to have a greater sense of patience. I like the saying with perennials, the first year they sleep, the second year they creep. And um, the third year they leap. So this is the spring, May 2018, where they were still sleeping. And, um, and then in 2019, where they began to creep. And then in 2020, where they made their first leap. So um, Emily pointed out how important it is to support the pollinators through the various growing seasons and beyond. And I'd like to um, take you through some of the plants that you can find in my little corner of the Tom Settlemeyer garden. So for early spring, these are just a few. But I've noticed uh, frequently the flower heads are a lot smaller and um, this is where activity starts and the uh, magnetizing begins. Many of the plants are also closer to the ground. They don't grow quite as tall. Here are some others. As the plants have matured, the other thing that I've noticed, I cover a lot of the plot with straw during the winter time. 
And there are a lot of birds that come in and build nests from the straw. And frequently I will find them under a rhubarb plant or at the base of a coneflower or whatever in early spring while they're setting up or staking out their ground. With the heat coming on and longer days of sunshine, the plots become more active and the flowers larger and the activity begins to pick up. Here are some of the flowers that you'll find um, in the summer on in that little space. I plant overly close, I imagine. I never think they're going to grow as large and spread out as large as they do. But nature seems to like a little bit of chaos that I have in that part of the world. Some more favorite summer um, hosting plants in the in those areas. One in particular that I'd like to call out is bee balm. I have um, the uh, wild bee balm in the wild, uh, the lavender color in the larger image. And then in the second image, you'll see a light pink and a, a hot pink and a scarlet red. And each variety appears to appeal to a different audience. So I'm grateful that all four of them are prospering there. Some of the uh, bone set and uh, Joe Pieweed and oregano, if you stand near any of those big mounding plants, you'll hear a lot of activity. The noise of the, the busyness and the hum of the work um, is really quite impressive. Some of the guests that arrive in this space. These are a few. Many of them, as Emily said, have their favorites. And um, two summers ago, um, an extended family of orb weavers uh, took up residence in one of the plots. And at one point I had three females and four females and three males that were had built webs throughout um, the space and their web development is really, really interesting with a heavy duty zigzag line and um, they kind of respond to the movement the breeze um, causes on the plant material. They're really wonderful. It was a wonderful experience and drew a lot of people to the plot. And then here's an example. Um, it's just great fun to eyewitness the various stages of life, how precious and fortunate to have these experiences on a regular basis so that I can see just the experience of impermanence and um, change that happens all around us every day. And then of course, one of my favorites, the hummingbird, I have the bee bomb that comes in earlier in the summer and the red cardinal, that is one of their favorites. It's a little bit later in August and into the beginning of September. Fall, asters and joe pie weed and sedum seem to attract and continue to um, support the local um, insects that visit the space, as well as the migratory um, birds that are passing through or um, species that are leaving us for warmer climates. And this is kind of fall, what it looks like. And again, a reminder for patience. In the lower right hand corner, you'll see my Joe pie weed on year two, and maybe it was two and a half or three feet high. And by year three, it was five and a half feet high. And now it's well over my head. It's, I think it's competing with Ellen's iron weed on the other side, diagonally across the garden. And finally, year round support, Emily had called out, continues in the winter months. I don't clean up very well. I don't cut back to the ground. I let the seed heads stay for winter feeding needs for birds that spend the winter with us. And stalks with hollow stems, I cut back 12 to 18 inches for um, the native pollinators that use them for setting up the next generations with care. And then the promise that I find in winter sowing, seed harvest from the, for future seasons and shared during the plant sale from the garden. Um, and that's what all of those plastic bins are. And I generally set them up in January, early February and um, 
hearts can start opening the lids um, sometimes at the end of April and beginning of May. So thank you everyone for your time. And at this point, I would like to pass it over to Barbara and she's going to um, share her experience with crafting a native garden at home. Go on. I'd like to share the process of turning our front yard into a pollinator garden. It's a small lot, uh, 60 feet by 20 in downtown Brunswick. So we knew when we started the garden that we wanted a mix of edible plants, plants from um, uh, native pollinator plants, and um, lots of lots of flowers. So I started out by getting plants from local nurseries. And um, one of the things that we wanted to have as a focal point was a peach tree, which I got from Fedco. And then I had a lot of homegrown native plants that I started from seed from uh, seeds that I got from the Native Seed Project. So then after we assembled the plants, or chose the plants, we had to um, prepare the planting area. So um, removing the grass was accomplished by tarping. And you can also do it by sheet mulching, which is using cardboard covered with organic mulch um, to kill the grass. And it's a good idea to start the process ahead of time because it takes time. So for, for this yard, I started, um, in the uh, spring, in the fall for spring planting. So let's see if I can see these other. So um, it's important to be playful, with the placement of the plants and the paths, and um, just take your time, move things around and just kind of see what pleases you. Um, so then you just dig in, uh, pun intended, um, again, playing with the placement of plants and paths and um, checking with your supervisor once in a while to make sure that you're doing a good job. The supervisor in this case being my dog, Clover. So um, here I am uh, digging around and uh, allowing plenty of room for the plants to spread out. Um, making sure that you don't crowd them too much. Although, as Joan said, um, some of them love to, to have close neighbors. Um, and then it will fill in. In a few years, I think this is two years later, you'll um, be amazed at you know, how much things have grown. And um, you'll also notice that the garden is constantly changing. Some things that you had um, an abundance one year, might kind of disappear for a year, and then they might come back. Um, I had some plants show up, like the milkweed on the right side, that I don't know where they came from. They just all of a sudden showed up. Um, they weren't there when I installed the garden, but obviously they were uh, sleeping under the ground, um, getting ready to, uh, to pop up. So, um, of course, you're going to find some challenges when you're doing your project. Um, in our case, there were a lot of non-native plants that we wanted to remove to make room for other plants. Um, there were some slopes that we had to deal with and a rotting timber wall along the driveway that had to go. Um, so the timber wall replacement was accomplished by um, making cages or gabions from lobster trap material. And then we anchored them to the slope along the driveway and filled them with rocks. And they made a really great retaining wall and probably um, habitat for some little insects too. And uh, um, they, they worked really well. So um, the, let's see, the, the retaining wall was um, 
He'll hold up the slope, which we then planted with native cranberries. And the uh, cranberries did a really good job of holding the soil in place. The rest of that side we planted with um, different varieties of blueberries mixed in with lots and lots of native um, plants, um, a lot of uh, butterfly milkweed and some turtle head and some cranesbill geranium and lots of other plants. Um, the cranberries just took right off and um, just made a fabulous ground cover. You can see the how they, they made a, a mat and just completely covered um, the slope. And um, then we had the benefit of the harvest. So every year we get a lot of cranberries um, from that, that plot. So this is that same side filling in a year or two later. Um, and just remember your garden will expand. It might not seem like much when you put it in, but you'll be amazed at how quickly it will grow. Um, and the pollinators will find you. It's a, you know, build it and they will come. These are just a few of the pollinators that I found um, and some more similar to things that Emily talked about, uh, Joan talked about, Ellen found in Tom Settle Mare Garden. Um, they found my garden. Um, lots and lots of monarchs and lots of other butterflies. And then feeding the caterpillars. Um, these are just two different species that I found, the black swallowtail on the left on some parsley that I had growing out front. Um, and then of course the monarch caterpillar on um, butterfly milkweed and regular milkweed. But I'm sure there were <laughs> dozens if not hundreds of other caterpillars lurking around in that garden um, and in the mulch around the garden. So it's really important to, um, as was mentioned, have a habitat for all seasons because each season different blooms will feed different pollinators. And um, the native plants have co-evolved with the native pollinators to provide nectar and pollen throughout all the seasons. So here are some of the spring blooming plants in my garden. And then here are some of the summer pollinator magnets. And in the summer, um, there are just so many native plants that are blooming that you can just have an amazing array of color and shape and size in your front yard. Um, and then we have the garden in the fall. Um, it can be really pretty as things start to die back. And as was mentioned, as Emily mentioned, the um, keystone species of asters and golden are in full bloom then. And um, it, it can be just a very attractive time of year and a very productive time of year for your garden, especially when you're thinking about habitat for the pollinators. You can see all that bare ground and the piles of rocks. And um, then of course the blooms. And then it's pretty in the winter also. Um, and again, just think about um, uh, seeds falling um, uh, and overwintering and then germinating in the spring so that you'll end up with more plants. And um, also uh, things that are growing that are living in the little crevices and in the bark mulch under the um, under the ground there. So um, let's see. The last thing that I want to share is um, uh, the the pollinator friendly garden certification through the Maine Extension Service. So um, one way to get ideas for starting a pollinator garden is to go to that website. Um, 
you can learn all about the different plants that provide nectar and pollen for each season, the different caterpillar host plants, and um, other uh, guidelines for certification will give you ideas for water sources, for ways to shelter the pollinators and protect them um, over the winter. And as Emily mentioned, leaving leaves and stems is very important. And um, then safeguarding your garden by not using any pesticides, managing invasive plants, and um, uh, using other conservation efforts such as mulching, collecting water for irrigation and composting. So um, the website really gives you a great uh, source for choosing plants for continuous bloom through all the seasons. And um, you can apply for certification if you want to, or you can just use it as a guide for building your own uh, pollinator garden. Um, you can apply for certification for a home garden or for a community garden as Ellen and Joan and I did at the Tom Settlemeyer Community Garden, or you could um, do a curbside garden along the, along the busy road outside your street and make that a pollinator garden. Or if you live in a, a condominium um, a, a complex or any kind of a neighborhood with a vacant lot, you can put a pollinator garden in there and get that uh, certified. So the, the possibilities are endless. And um, of course, you don't have to apply for the certification, but um, if you do, you can get one of these really cool signs to put in your garden um, from uh, the Humane Extension Service. So um, that's all, and thank you. Wow. Wow. Um, I thought I was a pretty good gardener, honestly, even with like the edible natives, but I have learned so much today. Um, and you've really inspired me, all of you, with the pictures and things as well. Uh, it is no wonder that we are past time. Oops. Hanging out with the best geeks on a Sunday afternoon. I love it. You're all awesome. Um, so with that, I want to be really clear that we respect everyone's time here um even though we we love you all and would yes, definitely I geek out with lost. you all the time but if you need to go now that is okay um we have some really generous presenters who are willing to give us a few extra minutes of their time despite us not asking for it uh because they would love to take some of your questions so we are not going to get through all of our questions i i had them too i told julia not to ask mine so <laughs> we are um but we will take a few okay so if you want to stay with us uh, we are going to go officially over time now and get a few of those questions answered. For those of you who do not get your questions answered, there are a ton of resources. And um, obviously, you have some great organizations to reach out to, and we will help you get answers to your questions. Come to BTLT, come to Growing to Give, come to Wild Seed Project, come to the Help Desk at Curtis Memorial Library, come to the Tom Settlemeyer Community Garden, get involved. I promise you, if you have a question, we will get it answered, or we'll find the researcher who's working on that, and then you can help them out. All right, with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Julia. Thank you all for attending, and we're gonna to get to some of these questions. All right, so I've been keeping track of all the questions in the chat. If you have more questions, feel free to drop them there or do the raise hand thing. But I'm gonna try and crank through some of these presenters. If you can um, give your best answer or a place where folks can go to find the answer, that would be great. First question that I wanted to bring up, um, Lorraine asked a question for Emily. Is there evidence that bees and wasps are declining in Maine, both in terms of diversity and as well as in biomass? Great question. Uh, yes, um, just we know habitats are disappearing, especially a lot of the specialized habitats that a lot of these bees in are in. Um, our blueberry fields specifically um, and grasslands like that have 
really rapidly been disappearing as we've let uh, woodlands grow into those areas. So a lot of the bees associated with that are disappearing. Um, there's at least two species of bumblebee that are considered extirpated from the state. We're actively looking for them, but that means they're extinct from, from this region. Um, but keep looking for bees as you're out and about because a lot of times, especially with insects, um, we'll think something has gone extinct and then they're just really good at hiding. <laughs> um, so you end up finding them, but it does look like uh, at least the not as cosmopolitan species are declining. Thank you, Emily. Um, another question, um, I think for Emily, so does pesticide contamination carry through to seed? So, um, and my sort of follow-up to that is how do we make sure we're buying plants that do not contain those neonics you were talking about? Um, yes, if they're neonicotinoid treated, um, then they it can come into the seeds. It'll come into truly every part of the plant, um, including the seeds. Uh, I think legally, at least in Maine, anything that's treated with neonicotinoids has to be um, written on it. It's um, only folks with the pesticide license can even access those pesticides um, now as of like a few years ago. Um, so it's less likely you're going to come across them, but they do need to be labeled if they're going to have that. I would just make sure you're buying plants and seeds from sources that specifically say they don't use it, though. That's that's the best way to tell. If if folks aren't using it, they're going to say it, and it's going to be somewhere on their website or on their packaging that it says no pesticides used or no nicotinoids used. Awesome. Thank you. Um, sort of a two-parter question here. Hillary was asking if someone could suggest native shrubs that are good for pollinator support. And then Betty also mentioned um, that she thought jewelweed and honeysuckle were invasive plants to pull out. Can someone address that as well? I can address that unless any of the garden folks want to. Um, there are so many great shrubs for pollinators. Um, a lot of our shrubs uh, are blooming at times that our wildflowers aren't blooming at. Um, so if you're looking for good pollinator shrubs are native bush honeysuckle. And that brings up the, the native, not native. Um, we have a couple species of honeysuckle that are native, um, but then there are, of course, a few that are invasive and um, uh, detrimental to the larger ecosystems. Um, there is also one species of jewelweed that's like the Himalayan jewelweed. It's got a pink flower instead of a yellow or a, um, orange flower. That one's non-native and not supporting pollinators the way the uh, native ones are. The native ones are more common in the state, so keep an eye out of flower color. If you have the pink ones, just pull them. They're pretty easy to pull. Try to get them before they've gone to seed um, because the seeds do shoot off um, and will reseed quite readily. Um, for shrubs, we actually uh, have a shrub guide that covers a whole bunch of different shrubs, a bunch of different sizes. So I encourage you to look into that. Um, it's really helpful for um, specific caterpillars that feed on them. Shrubs tend to have kind of a dual positive for pollinators, where a lot of them are provide the leaf host plant for uh, caterpillars. And then a lot of them also are flowering and provide a lot of resources for nectar feeding and pollinate, pollen feeding species. So we've got a whole bunch of um, dogwoods and viburnums, um, sumacs, uh, things like that, that do a really good job for pollinators. And button bush is another one that's amazing um, to attract the pollinators, one of my favorites. Awesome, thank you. Um, questions about some wasps. Um, is there a species of yellow jacket or wasp that nests underground? And are there any wasps that prey on Japanese beetles? Uh, yes and yes. <laughs> um, so the ground nesting yellow jackets still have the same type of paper wasp or paper nest. It's just underground. Um, so not fun when you're pulling up plants and you run into them. Um, and it can be hard to tell what species is going after you when you've pulled up, say, a weed and all of a sudden you're getting stung. Um, but these guys tend to, a, a lot of the like bumblebees that are ground nesting and things like that, you tend to hear them before they start stinging. Whereas the yellow jackets, not always. <laughs> uh, and then uh, Japanese beetles, yes, there's uh, uh, several wasps that feed on scarab beetle larvae. 
Um, you'll see them, a lot of the scarab beetles, the larvae are in kind of turf field type habitats, and you'll see these wasps hovering over the um, grass areas um, looking for larvae to lay their eggs on. Um, and that's generally the stage that they're in. There is a uh, tachinid, I think it's a tachinid that was released for um, the Japanese beetles. So if you're going through and killing, like mechanically killing your Japanese beetles, um, keep an eye out because you'll see these little white spots on their, on like the top of um, their back. And if those are on there, they're the pupa of that uh, parasitoid. Um, and it's essentially a dead beetle walking around. So you don't want to kill that one. You want to let it keep going and spread that um, species. And you can find a lot of information about that on, I believe, Humane Extension and the main um, bug watch. Very cool. New appreciation for wasps. Um, are there particular things to do or not to do for the soil for those bees who live underground? Great question. Um, it really depends on the, the bee. There's not much we have to do besides allow there to be open space. Um, the bees will find those areas. They know what to do. They'll, they'll dig and excavate what they need. Um, one thing that I really like to point out is with bumblebees. I got a lot of questions with people um, in kind of tick panic. Um, there's a product out that is a essentially a pesticide that you treat um, and put it into uh, like rodent holes. Um, please avoid those because they're supposed. They say it's super effective because it targets these ticks that are on the the vector mouse, but it's actually really detrimental to those ground nesting um, bumblebees that are using those holes. That's my PSA. That's super good to know. Um, quick question: Are there any undes undesirable species that use the bee hotels um, that have become common for folks to put out? Um, I can't think of any specific undesirable species, but it's more those bee hotels can become problematic um, depending on where you get them. Um, sometimes there there's like treated uh, bamboo and things like that that are used to build them, which is no good for our wildlife. Um, some of them um, have to be like cleaned out every year or else they get kind of rotten and moldy and then you're adding a bunch of issues to these insects. Um, generally, I like to think uh, these bugs know what they're doing as long as we provide the basis for them, they'll be fine. Um, I've tried a couple of those bee hotels and I, I haven't had success with them, though sometimes I'll see those bees in like a wood pile that I had sitting around like next to the hotel. But I have talked to people who um, got them from good sources. They knew they weren't treated and they worked really well for them. So I think it's kind of a hit or miss type of object. All right. And then just a quick clarifying question. Um, can you explain a little bit more about the cellophane substance that you were talking about and what that is made of? Yeah, uh, well, I can try to. There's actually, uh, they're still trying to figure out exactly what it is. Um, they think it's a mixture of um, this. They know it comes from a gland somewhere in the head and they think that that substance is mixing with just saliva. Um, and it kind of becomes this waterproof plaster. They it might have to do with some um plant materials, but they're they're really not sure. They're always trying to to figure out more and more about how that works and why it works, because it would be useful. <laughs> it could be useful. Um, but there's still so much to learn in the world of insects, which is cool. Very cool. Okay. And then the last question that I compiled here, um, that I think is probably for everybody. Someone was asking about a meadow, using a meadow as the ideal site for um, growing a pollinator garden. Wondering if you guys could just speak to that. Ellen or Barbara or Joan, I feel like this might be a question you want to take. Sure. Well, I, I think, you know, um, it's good, it's good, but you really want to start small. And I, and as the folks with the Wild Seed Project know from some of their rewilding and habitat restoration work that it takes a lot of prep. So you would want to be, you know, kind of being um, intentional around how you prepare the soil using, um, you know, plugs as opposed to um, just scattering seeds as an example is one, one strategy. And, you know, it may be that um, you can start with a smaller 
piece and then try the plants know what they want you know what to do and i guess when uh, joan was talking about the um the different stages of how these plants go they i mean this new york ironweed that i planted is now showing up in other parts of the garden on you know maybe a little uninvited but sort of fun to see um so particularly meadow plants they they their seeds go on the wind and once they find a good place to that they're happy they will um colonize in their own way recolonize so uh, so i don't know anyone else want to chime in well, for the last two or three years, um, Ellen and I and other people have been making seed bombs. And um, so we've, you know, taken native seeds and mixed them with potting soil and clay and tossed them out into various places around Brunswick, mostly, and Topsom and other places. And um, keep waiting to see them come up. Ellen and I think we saw some milkweed um, in a in a field or a meadow um, near the municipal parking lot. Um, and sometimes it takes a year or two before the seeds will germinate. So it's like Ellen said, if they find the right place, they're going to um, engage and start growing. So I'm going to keep throwing out my seed bombs, even though I don't have any uh, any evidence or much evidence yet that um we're creating meadows so it's we'll called see. you could look up gorilla gardening and they'll tell you everything you need to know about how to do um this kind of work right thank you all so so much um we are at past 4 45 now so we are going to wrap up for the evening if you still have burning questions um our presenters have all shared a lot of really amazing resources so please go do some digging um hazel has shared that the library has tons of resources as well and i also invite you to come and find us at the tom settlemeyer garden this summer um like i said ellen and barbara and joan and myself are all constant presence is there. Um, please come get involved with us and you will, will probably learn a lot just being in that space. Um, Wild Seed Project is an awesome resource and we thank Emily again for being here today. And um, if you want to check out their website, they have a ton of recommendations of plants you can grow. So thank you all for sticking around to, to get your questions answered. And thank you, Emily, Joan, Ellen, and Barbara. And we will see you all at the next workshop. That's next Sunday at Curtis Memorial Library. And that is on the invasive jumping worms. So if you have questions about that, that you'd love to get answered, <laughs> come, come join us as well. All right. Bye, everyone. Have a great rest of your Sunday evening. Thank you for being here with us. Yeah, thank you. Bye, y'all.